Soaring temperatures and strong winds hamper rescue efforts in Australia. With more deaths and devastation, thousands of troops are sent in to help. Our correspondent, Dan Rivers, is at the heart of the worst-hit region. The fire's just ripped through the woods at the back of this house and has taken this shed and caravan at the back. I've just talked to the owner. Everything he owns is inside. Also tonight in Iraq, after thousands chant death to America at the funeral of an assassinated Iranian general, an American military base and its embassy are targeted by rockets. Here, supporters of crash victim Harry Dunn demand the American woman accused of running him down faces justice. And in the FA Cup, League One Rochdale win a lucrative replay against Premier League Newcastle. This is ITV News with Alistair Stewart. Good evening. Not even 3,000 troops can hold the forces of nature at bay. Sent to help those trapped by Australia's raging inferno, they faced soaring temperatures and roaring winds, which made their task much more difficult. Two more people have died. Many more are still missing. The Queen has sent a message of condolence to all Australians, saying that she is deeply saddened by the devastating fires. Well, our correspondent Dan Rivers has been to the heart of the firestorm and begins his report in Batemans Bay, 150 miles south of Sydney. They'd warned of a day of monster fires, and as the northwesterly wind suddenly blew in, they roared into life right on cue. Devouring trees and bushland, the heroes in helicopters again flying into battle. But this was an enemy that was moving at speed. Those in its path could only watch and hope. This has been going on for five or six weeks, so we've just been doing it the whole time. And like it, I, our businesses are up the end there, and the other day we had to fight them up there, so now we're over here. From his hilltop home, Ben Molinar surveys an apocalyptic scene, which he believes is directly a result of man-made emissions. We live in a sunburned country, and we have to appreciate that's what it is. I mean, there is a climate change element to this, absolutely and utterly. <laughs> it's like standing in a, in a pizza oven, right? That's what it is. This is what they were fearing today on Saturday, searing temperatures which are now close to 50 degrees Celsius and wildfires which are now out of control. We drive 100 miles up the coast and things suddenly take a dramatic turn. A fire has exploded out of the bush and into the tiny community of Manana. They're trying to hold the line as the flames consume sheds at the back of one home, exploding gas bottles adding to the danger. It's literally all hands to the pump, residents and firefighters shoulder to shoulder, supported from the air. The fire's just ripped through the woods at the back of this house and has taken this shed and caravan at the back. I've just talked to the owner. Everything he owns is inside. We've been here for nearly 30 years, so... Yeah, everything, everything else in here, clothing, everything. So it's so, so horrible, right, really. But this time, against the odds, the firefighters have won, some clearly suffering from the acrid smoke. Robert's home is saved. He knows how exhausted they are he himself was a firefighter for 18 years, but the respite is short-lived. Earlier than forecast, a vicious southerly suddenly hits. It's time to get out, and the road is now a dangerous gauntlet of fallen trees and fire. This was a terrifying end to a brutal day. The final toll of this crisis will be colossal. And Dan joins me live, as you can see. Dan, you worked, woke two or three hours ago to a dramatic and unexpected change in the weather, which may bring the possibility of some relief, I gather. Alistair, it's, it's completely different this morning, Sunday morning here in Australia now. The temperature has dropped 31 degrees. We've gone from... 50 uh, last night, yesterday afternoon at the height of the fires to now 19 degrees. And that's really going to make a big difference here for the firefighters trying to get into areas they've been prevented from getting into to damp down. And hopefully this will give uh, a chance for them to try and get on top of this. Uh, those messages of support from the royal family will be extremely welcome here uh, as well. The firefighters have been working uh, around the clock 
to try and get on top of this. Uh, there's also been an enormous amount of criticism for the Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, from people uh, here. Uh, they call him, they've dubbed him Scotty from Marketing. He's again put out another kind of message on Twitter, video on Twitter today, uh, justifying the spending and the resources put in. But a lot of people here are very hostile towards him. Dan, thank you. In Iraq, the drip feed of retribution for America's assassination of a top Iranian general has begun. Rockets were fired at a military base housing U.S. forces and the compound in Baghdad containing the American embassy. No one was injured, but it follows a huge demonstration at a funeral march where death to America was the chant of choice. And tonight, after pointed criticism from the United States, Britain has defended America's right to carry out the strike. Neil Connery reports. Huge crowds took to Baghdad streets as the funeral procession for Iran's top general killed in Friday's US drone strike got underway. Iran has vowed severe revenge for the death of Qasem Soleimani. As three days of mourning began, the coffin of the Iranian military commander was draped in the country's flag. The fury over his killing and that of Iraqi militant leaders clear at every turn. They burned US flags and chanted death to America. Among the mourners wearing a grey cap, Iraq's Prime Minister, Adel Abdel Mahdi, who's condemned the killing, warning it will light the fuse of war. As Iran prepares to bury Soleimani on Tuesday, President Rouhani met his daughter Zainab in Tehran. She was filmed asking who will seek vengeance for her father's death. Don't you worry about that, he replied. In the Iranian holy city of Qom, they raised a red flag above the Jamkharan Mosque, a traditional Shiite symbol of blood spilled unjustly and a call to avenge. Tonight in Iraq, tens of thousands came to the sacred Shiite shrine at Karbala as the coffins of those killed were carried aloft. As the morning begins, President Trump insists Soleimani was planning imminent operations against American interests, but has yet to show evidence to support his claim. Across the Middle East, the reprisals for his killing are now being feared. Neil Connery, ITV News. And in the last few minutes, President Trump has tweeted to say that the United States will retaliate if Iran takes the revenge that it has threatened. He says, if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, we have targeted 52 Iranian sites, and those targets and Iran itself will be hit very hard and very fast. Here, the family of the crash victim, Harry Dunn, and supporters staged a protest today demanding the American woman charged over his death be returned to the UK. Around 100 people demonstrated outside RAF Crowton in Northamptonshire, where Anne Sekula's husband was based and close to where Harry died. They say there will be more protests until she returns to face justice. We promised him that we would get justice for him, and that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, and obviously with the support from the, from the community that stems, not, not just in, to, in the village, the fan, friends and family, but nationwide and even from all over the world, we've had messages of, of support from people. So, yeah, we really feel like we're on the right track to doing the right thing here. Skier Starmer's finally confirmed that he is standing to replace Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader. In a video and newspaper article, the shadow Brexit secretary says the party must rebuild fast to win back the trust of the people, but also retain the radicalism of recent years. Firefighters in hazardous materials suits were called to a house in Manchester today after a man was reported to have swallowed seeds which contain a small amount of the toxic chemical ricin. Sir Rod Stewart's been charged by Florida police after allegedly punching a hotel security guard on New Year's Eve. He is due to appear in court next month. And finally, there has been another feast of goals today. The third round of the FA Cup, traditionally the chance for a smaller club to turn giant killer. And it didn't disappoint, with several lower clubs proving more than a match for their so-called superiors. Chris Scudder has all of the action. 
An FA Cup first on third round day. The Prince William backed heads up meant every tie kicked off a minute late to make time for mental health. Neither Wolves or Manchester United could manage a goal though. Wolves thought they'd won it with a late header, but the referee spotted a handball. No VAR needed, but a replay of the tie is required. Meanwhile, Premier League Newcastle and League One Rochdale were separated by two divisions and 49 places, and it was no surprise when Newcastle led through the Paraguayan Almiron. But the Cup's a great leveller, and Rochdale spanned the generations to save the day. 17-year-old Luke Matheson with the assist, and Aaron Wilbraham at the grand old age of 40, making sure Rochdale can look forward to a lucrative payday from the replay at St James's Park. Another League One club, Tranmere, did even better on Premier League turf. They looked on course for a thrashing when they went three goals down at Watford. But remarkably, they fought their way back, and Paul Mullins' penalty leveled things up at 3-3. They'll have home advantage for the replay. Blackpool of League One had a chance to win at Reading, one division above them, but with the score at 2-2, Armand Gnandouillet went for a clever spot kick and paid the penalty. They too will replay. It wasn't a great day for the top clubs. Aston Villa lost 2-1 at Fulham, who they replaced in the Premier League this season. And Brighton's cup run came to an end at the first hurdle at the hands of Sheffield Wednesday from the Championship. And at one stage, plucky Port Vale from League Two were dreaming of a cup upset when they dared to equalise against mighty Man City. But the cup holders ultimately had too much and accelerated away to a 4-1 win. Chris Scudder, ITV News. And that is it from me and the whole weekend team. I'll be back with you again tomorrow, but until then, a very good night to you. Bye-bye.